I'll go ahead and pull that up for you. Slightly disappointed, not necessarily, but um, uh, let me find it. Oh, there it is. Um, so I wanted it to wanted you to have a better picture to look at than uh, than just me talking. So I I pulled up some pictures of uh, this is some fan art of of uh, some of the different characters. So this is Halt. This is what someone drew of Halt, and this is Horus over here. So that was pretty cool. So I was going to put that up if the uh, if the book didn't work, but since it works, I'll go ahead and pull that up so that you guys can read along. Okay, so Will was able to make it back to Castle Arland and our Castle Redmont, excuse me, and um, and he was able to get. Baron Errold and um, Sir Rodney, and they're going to try to meet at the ruins of Gorlin. I wonder where I've heard that word name before. Um, and hopefully they're going to meet up with Halt there, and then they'll track down the Kalkara. So here we go. Chapter 29. Through that long afternoon, Will felt as if he had lived his entire life in the saddle, his only respite being the hourly changes from one horse to another. A brief pause to dismount, Loosen the girth straps of the horse he had been riding, tighten those on the horse which had been following, then he would remount and ride on. Again and again he marveled at the amazing endurance shown by Tug and Blaze as they maintained their steady canter. He even had to rein them in a little to keep pace with the battle horses ridden by the two knights. Big, powerful, and trained for wars they might be, they couldn't match the constant pace of the ranger horses in spite of the fact that they were fresh when the small party had left Castle Redmond. Okay, please stop playing with the whiteboard, guys. They rode without speaking. There was no time for idle talk, in, and even if there had been, it would have been difficult to hear one another above the drumming thunder of the heavy, four heavy battle horses and the lighter rattle of tug and blazer's hooves and the constant clank of equipment and weapons that accompanied them as they rode. Both men carried long war lances, hard ash poles more than three meters in length, tipped with a heavy iron point. In addition, each had a broadsword strapped to the saddles, huge two-handed weapons that dwarfed the swords they normally wore in day-to-day -day use. And Rodney had a heavy battle axe slung at the rear, rear right pommel of the saddle. So I'm not sure who put on the, the whiteboard, but you can see that it's up on the screen. So if you can take that off, that'd be great. It was the lances on which they would place greatest trust, however. They would keep the Kalkara at a distance, and so reduce the chance that the knights might be frozen by the terrifying stare of the two beasts. Apparently, the hypnotic gaze was only effective at close quarters. If a man couldn't see the eyes clearly, there was little chance of their paralyzing him with their gaze. Okay, guys. Um, somebody's put on um this whiteboard um the whiteboard stuff please take it off thank you the sun was dropping fast behind them throwing their shadows out before them long and distorted by the low angle light Harold glanced over his shoulder at the sun's position and called to will how long before dusk will will turned in his saddle and frowned at the descending ball of light before answering answering less than an hour my lord the Baron shook his head doubtfully. It'll be a close run to get there before full dark then, he said. He urged his battle horse onward, increasing speed a little. Tug and Blaze matched the increase without effort. None of them wanted to be hunting the Kalkara in the dark. The hour's rest at the castle had done wonders for Will, but it seemed that it happened in another lifetime now. He thought over the cursory briefing that Errol had given as they mounted to leave Redmond. If they found the Kalkar at the Gorlan ruins, Will was to hold back while the Baron and Sir Rodney charged the two monsters. There were no complex tactics involved, just a headlong charge that might take the two killers by surprise. If Holt's there, I'm sure he'll take a hand too. But I want you well back out of harm's way, Will. That bow of yours won't make any impression on a Kalkara. Yes, sir, Will had said. He had no intention of getting close to the Kalkara. He was more than content to leave things to the two knights, protected by their shields, helmets, 
and half armor of chain mail shirts and leggings. However, their herald's next words quickly dispelled any overconfidence he might have had in their ability to deal with the beasts. If the things get the better of us, I want you to ride for more help. Carol and the others will be somewhere behind us. Find them, then go after the Kalkara with them. Track those beasts down and kill them. Will had said nothing to that. The fact that Errol even contemplated failure when he and Rodney were the two foremost knights within a 200 kilometer radius spoke volumes of his concern about the Kalkara. For the first time, Will realized that in this contest, the odds were heavily against them. The sun was trembling on the brink of the world, the shadows at their longest, and they still had several kilometers to go. Baron Erold raised a hand and brought the party to a stop. He glanced at Rodney and jerked a thumb at the bundle of pitch-soaked torches each man carried behind his saddle. Torches, Rodney, he said briefly. The battle master dem demurred for a moment. Are you sure, my lord? They'll give away our position if the Kara car are watching. Harold shrugged. They'll hear us coming anyway, and among the trees we'll move too slowly without the light. Let's take the chance. He was already striking his flint and steel together, igniting a spark that sent, set his small pile of tinder smoking and flaring into flame. He held the torch in the flame, and the thick, sticky pine pitch with, with, with which it was impregnated suddenly caught and burst into yellow flame. Rodney leaned toward him with another torch and lit it in the Baron's flame. Then, holding the torches high, their lances held in place by the leather thongs looped around their right wrists, they resumed their gallop, thundering into the darkness beneath the trees as they finally left the broad road they had been following since noon. It was another ten minutes before they heard the screaming. It was an unearthly sound that twisted the stomach into knots of fear and turned the blood cold. Involuntarily, the Baron and Sir Rodney reined in as they heard it. The horses plunged wildly against the reins. It came from straight ahead of them and rose and fell until the night air quaked with the horror of it. Good God in heaven, the Baron exclaimed. What is that? His face was ashen as the hellish sound soared through the night toward them to be answered immediately by another identical howl. The Will had heard the terrible noise before. He felt the blood leave his face now as he realized his fears were being proven correct. It's the Kakara, he said. They're hunting. And he knew there was only one person out there that they could be after. They had turned back and were hunting Holt. Look, my lord, Rodney said pointing to the rapidly darkening night sky. Through a break in the tree cover, they saw it, a sudden flare of light reflected in the sky, evidence of a fire in the near distance. That's Holt, the Baron said, bound to be, and he'll need help. He rammed his spurs into the tired battle horse's flanks, urging the beast forward into a lumbering gallop, the torch in his hand screaming flame and sparks behind him as Sir Rodney and Will galloped in his track. It was an eerie sensation, following those flaming, spitting torches through the trees, their elongated tongues of flame blowing back behind the two riders, casting weird and terrifying shadows among the trees, while ahead of them, the glow of the large fire, presumably lit by Holt, grew stronger and nearer with each stride. They broke out of the trees with virtually no warning, and before them was a scene from nightmares. There was a short space of open grass, then the ground beyond was a litter of tumbled rocks and boulders. Giant pieces of masonry, still held together by mortar, lay scattered on their sides and edges, sometimes half buried in the soft grassy earth. The ruined walls of Castle Gorlin surrounded the scene on three sides, nowhere rising to more than five meters in height destroyed and cast down by a vengeful kingdom after Morgoth had been driven out of his keep and back into the mountains of rain and night. The resulting chaos of rocks and sections of tumbled wall was like the playground of a giant child, scattered in all directions, piled carelessly on top of one another, leaving virtually no clear ground at all. The whole scene was illuminated by the leaping, twisting flames of a bonfire some 40 meters in front of them, and beside it, a horrific figure crouched, 
screaming hatred and fury, plucking uselessly at the mortal wound in its chest that had finally brought it down. Over two and a half meters tall, with shaggy, matted, scale-like hair covering its entire body, the Kalkara had long, talon-clad talon arms that reached to beneath its knees. Relatively short, powerful hind legs gave it the ability to cover the ground at a deceptive speed in a series of leaps and bounds. All of this the three riders took in as they emerged from the trees. But what they noticed most was the face, savage and ape-like with huge yellowed canine teeth and red glowing eyes filled with hatred and the blind desire to kill. The face turned toward them now and a beast screamed a challenge, tried to rise and stumbled back into a half crouch again. <coughs> What's wrong with it? Rodney asked, reining in his horse. Will pointed to the cluster of arrows that protruded from its chest. There must have been eight of them, all placed within a hand's breadth of each other. Look, he cried, look at the arrows. Holt, with his uncanny ability to aim and fire a blue blur of movement, must have sent a volley of arrows, one after the other, to smash into the armor-like matted hair, each one widening a gap in the monster's defenses until the final arrow had penetrated deep into its flesh. Its black blood ran in sheets down its torso, and again it screamed its hatred at them. Rodney, yelled Baron Arrow, with me, now. Dropping the lead rein to his spare horse, he tossed the flaming torch to one side, crouched, couched his lance, and charged. Rodney was a half second behind him, the two battle horses thundering across the open space. The Kalkara, its life blood saturating the ground at its feet, rose to meet them, in time to take the two lance points, one after the other, in the chest. It was all but dead. Even so, the weight and strength of the monster checked the onward rush of the battle horses. They reared back on their haunches as both knights leaned forward in the stirrups to drive the lance points home. The sharp iron penetrated, smashing through the matted hair. The force of the charge drove the Kalkara from its feet and hurled it backward into the flames of the fire behind it. For an instant, nothing happened. Then there was a blinding flash and a pillar of red flame that reached 10 meters into the night sky. And quite simply, the Kalkara disappeared. The two battle horses reared in terror, Rodney and the Baron only just managing to retain their seats. They backed away from the fire. There was a terrible reek of charred hair and flesh filling the air. Vaguely, Will remembered Holt discussing the way to deal with the Kakara. He had said that they were rumored to be particularly susceptible to fire. <laughs> Some rumor, he thought heavily, trotting tugged forward to join the two knights. Rodney was rubbing his eyes, still dazzled by the enormous flash. What the devil caused that? he asked. The Baron gingerly retrieved his lance from the fire. The wood was charred and the point blackened. It must be the waxy substance that mats their hair together into that hard shell, he replied in a wondering tone of voice. It must be highly flammable. Well, whatever it was, we did it, Rodney replied, a note of satisfaction in his voice. The Baron shook his head. Holt did it, he corrected his battlemaster. We merely finished them all. Rodney nodded, accepting the correction. The Baron glanced at the fire, still pouring a torrent of sparks into the air, but settling back now from the huge explosion of red flame. He must have lit this fire when he sensed they were circling back on him. He lit up the area so he had light to shoot by. He shot all right, Sir Rodney put in. Those arrows must have all struck within a few square centimeters. They looked around, searching for some sign of the ranger. Then, below the ruined walls of the castle, Will caught sight of a familiar object. He dismounted and ran to retrieve it, and his heart sank as he picked up Holt's powerful longbow, smashed and splintered into two pieces. He must have fired from over here, he said, indicating the point below the ruined wall where he had found the bow. They looked up 
imagining the scene, trying to recreate it. The Baron took the shattered weapon from Will as he remounted Tug. And the second Kalkara reached him as it killed his brother. The question is, where is Holt now? And where is the other Kalkara? That was when they heard the screaming start again. Chapter 30 Inside the ruined, overgrown courtyard, Holt crouched among the tumbled masonry that had once been Morgrath's stronghold. His leg, numb where the Kalkara had clawed him, was beginning to throb painfully, and he could feel the blood seeping past the rough bandage he had thrown around it. Somewhere close by, he knew the second Kalkara was searching for him. He heard its shuffling movements from time to time, and once, even its rasping breath as it moved close to its hiding place between two fallen sections of wall. It was only a matter of time before it found him, he knew, and when that happened, he was finished. He was wounded and unarmed. His bow was gone, smashed in that first terrifying charge when he had fired arrow after arrow into the first of the two monsters. He knew the power of his bow and the penetrative qualities of his razor sharp heavy arrowheads. He couldn't believe that the monster had continued to absorb that hail of arrows and still come on, seemingly undaunted. By the time it faltered, it was already too late for Holt to turn his attention to its companion. The second Kalkara was almost upon him, its massive taloned pole smashing the bow from his grasp, so that he barely had time to scramble for safety and onto the ruined wall. As it clawed its way after him, he had drawn his sax knife and tried to strike at the terrible head. But the beast had been too fast for him, and the heavy knife merely glanced off one of its armored forearms. At the same time, he had found himself confronted by its red, hate-filled eyes and felt his mind leaving him, his muscles freezing in terror as he was drawn to the horrific beast before him. It took an immense effort to wrench his eyes away from the creature's gaze, and he staggered back losing the sax knife as the bear-like claws swiped at him and ripped down the length of his thigh. Then he had run, unarmed and bleeding, trusting to the maze-like confusion of the ruins to evade the monster behind him. He had sensed the change in the Kalkara's movements around late afternoon. Their steady and previously undeviating path to the northeast suddenly changed as the two beasts abruptly separated, each turning through 90 degrees and moving in different directions into the forest that surrounded them. Their trails, up until then so easy to follow, also showed signs of concealment, so that only a tracker as skilled as a ranger could have been, would have been able to follow them. For the first time in years, Holt felt a cold stone of fear in his belly as he realized the Kakara were now hunting him. The ruins were close by, and he elected to make a stand there rather than in the woods. He knew that Kalkara would come after him once night fell, so he prepared as best he could, gathering dead wood to form the bonfire. He even found half a jar of cooking oil in the ruins of the kitchen. It was rancid and foul-smelling, but it would still burn. He poured it over the pile of wood and moved back to a spot where he could place the wall at his back. He had fashioned a supply of torches and kept them burning as darkness fell and he waited for the implacable killers to come for him. He sensed them before he saw them, then he made out the two shambling forms, darker patches against the darkness of the trees. They saw him immediately, of course. The flickering torch jammed into the wall behind him made sure of that, but they missed the pile of oil-soaked wood, and that was what he had been counting on. As they screamed their hunting cries, he tossed, tossed the burning torch into the pile and the flames leaped up instantly, flaring yellow in the darkness. For a moment, the beasts hesitated. Fire was their one fear. But they saw the ranger was nowhere near the flames and they came on, straight into the hail of arrows that Holt had met them with. If they'd had another 100 meters to cover, he might have managed to stop them both. He still had over a dozen arrows in his quiver, but time and distance were against him, and he had barely escaped with his life. Now he huddled beneath two pieces of masonry, 
that formed an A-shaped refuge, hidden in a shadow indentation in the ground, his cloak concealing him as it had for years. His only hope now was that Will would arrive with Errol and Rodney. If he could evade the creatures, creature until help came, he might have a chance. He tried not to think of the other possibility, that Gillen would arrive before them, alone and armed only with his bow and sword. Now that he had seen the Kapkara close up, Holt knew that one man had little chance of standing against it. If Gillen arrived before the knights, he and Holt would both die here. The creature was quartering the old courtyard now, like a hunting dog in search of game, adopting a methodical search pattern back and forth, examining every space, every cranny, every possible hiding place. This time he knew it would find him. His hand touched the hilt of a small throwing knife, the only weapon left to him. It would be a puny, almost useless defense, but it was all he had left. Then he heard it, the unmistakable heavy drumming of battle horses. Horses hooves. He looked up, watching the Tarkara through a small gap between the rocks that concealed him. It had heard them too. It was standing erect, its face turned toward the sound outside the ruined walls. The horses stopped, and he heard the ringing scream of the mortally wounded Kalkara outside as it challenged these new enemies. The hoofbeats rose again, gaining speed and momentum. Then there was a scream and a gigantic red flash that towered for a moment into the sky. Dimly, Holt reasoned that the first Kalkara must have been thrust into the fire. He began to inch back, wiggling out of his hiding place. Perhaps he could outflank the remaining Kalkara, moving to the side and scaling the wall before it noticed him. The chances seemed good. His attention was, na was drawn now to whatever was happening outside. But even as he had the thought, he realized it was no option. Though the Kalkara had apparently forgotten him for the moment, he was moving stealthily toward the tumbled masonry that formed a rough stairway to the top of the wall. In a few more minutes, he would be in position to drop on his unsuspecting friends on the other side, taking them by surprise. He had to stop it. Holt was clear of the hiding place now, the small fire sliding free of the sheath, almost, I'm sorry, the small knife sliding free of the sheath, almost of its own volition as he ran across the courtyard, dodging and weaving among the scattered rubble. The Kalkara before him heard him before he had gone half a dozen paces and it turned back on him, terrifying its silence as it loped ape-like to cut off before he could warn his friends. Holt stopped sudden, suddenly, stock still, eyes locked on the shambling figure coming at him. In another few meters, its hypnotic gaze would seize control of his mind. He felt the irresistible urge to look into those red eyes growing stronger. Then he closed his own eyes, his brow furrowed in fierce concentration, and brought his knife hand up, back and forward in one smooth, instinctive memory throw, seeing the target moving in his mind's eye mentally aligning the throw and the spin of the knife to the point in space where knife and target would arrive simultaneously. Only a ranger could have made that throw, and only one of a handful of them. It took the Kalkara in its right eye, and the beast screamed in pain and fury as it stopped to clutch at the sudden lance of agony that began in its eye, and seared all the way to the pain senses in its brain. Then Holt was running past it for the wall, scrambling up the rocks. Will saw him as a shadowy figure as he scrambled onto the top of the ruined wall. A shadowy or not, there was something in unmistakable about it. Halt! he cried, pointing so that the two knights saw him as well. All three of them saw the ranger pause, look back, and hesitate. Then a huge shape began to appear a few meters behind him as the Kalkara, whose wound was painful but nowhere near mortal, came after him. Baron Erold went to remount, then realizing that no horse could pick its way through the tumbled rocks and masonry beside the wall, he dragged his huge broadsword from its saddle scabbard and ran toward the ruins. Get back, Will, 
he shouted as he advanced, and Will nervously edged Tug back to the fringe of the trees. On the wall, Holt heard the shout and saw Errol running forward. Sir Rodney was close behind him, a huge battle axe whirring in circles above his head. Jump, Holt! Jump! the Baron shouted, and Holt needed no further invitation. He leaped the three meters from the wall, rolling to break his fall as he landed. Then he was up on his feet, running awkwardly to meet the two knights as the wound in his leg reopened. Will watched, his heart in his mouth, as Holt ran toward the two knights. Calcara hesitated a moment. Then, screaming a blood-curdling challenge, it leaped after him. But whereas Holt had rolled to recover, the Calcara simply transformed the three-meter drop into a huge, bounding leap, its unbelievably powerful rear legs driving it up and forward, covering the ground between it and Holt in that one movement. The massive arms swung, catching Holt a glancing blow and sending him rolling forward, unconscious. But the beast had no time to finish him off, as Baron Erold stepped up to meet it, the broadsword humming in a deadly arc for its neck. The Kakara was wickedly fast, and it ducked the killing blow, then slammed its talons into Errol's exposed back before he could recover from the stroke. They slashed the chain mail as if it were wool, and Errol grunted in pain and surprise as the force of the blow drove him to his knees, the broadsword falling from his hands, blood streaming from half a dozen deep gashes in his back. He would have died then and there, had it not been for Sir Rodney. The battlemaster whirled the heavy ax, war axe as if it were a toy and crashed it into the Kakara's side. The armor of wax matted hair protected the beast, but the sheer force of the blow staggered it so that it reeled back from the night, screaming in fury and frustration. Sir Rodney advanced, placing himself protectively between the Kalkara and the prone figures of Holt and the Baron. His feet set, the axe drawing back for another crushing blow. And then, strangely, he let the weapon fall from his grasp and stood before the monster, totally at its, at its mercy, as the power of the Kalkara's gaze, now channeled through its one good eye, robbed him of his will and his ability to think. The Kalkara screamed its victory to the night sky. Black blood streamed down its face. Never in its life had it felt such pain as these three puny men had inflicted on it. And now they would die for presuming to stand against it. But the primitive intelligence that drove it wanted its moment of triumph, and it screamed again and again over the three helpless men. Will watched, horrified. A thought was forming. An idea was lurking somewhere at the edge of his mind. He looked to one side, saw the flickering torch that Baron Erold had discarded. Fire! The one weapon that could defeat the Kakara! But he was forty meters away. He whipped an arrow from his quiver, slipped from the saddle and running lightly to the flickering torch. A good supply of sticky, melted pitch had run down the handle of the torch, and he quip quickly rolled the arrowhead in the soft, clinging stuff, forming a huge gobbit of it on the arrow. They placed it in the flame until it flared to life. Forty meters away, the huge, evil creature was satisfying its need for triumph. Its screams rolling and echoing through the night as it stood over the two bodies. Halt, unconscious. Baron Errol in a daze of pain. Sir Rodney stood, stood, still stood, frozen in place, hands dangling helplessly by his side as he waited for his death. Now the Kalkara raised one massive talon paw to strike him down, and all the knight could feel was the paralyzing terror of its gaze. Will brought the arrow back to full draw, wincing at the pain as the flame singed against his bow hand. He raised his aim point a little to allow for the extra weight of the pitch and released. The arrow soared in a spark trailing arc, the wind of its passage subduing the flame to a mere cold. The Kalkara saw the flash of light coming and turned to look, sealing its own fate as the arrow struck it square in its massive chest. It barely penetrated an inch into the hard, scale-like hair, 
But as the arrow came to a halt, the little flame flared again. The bonding material in the hair around it caught, and the flame began to spread with incredible speed. Now the Kalkara screams had terror in them as it felt a touch of fire. The one thing in life it feared. The monster beat at the flames on its chest with its paws, but that served only to spread the fire to its arms. There was a sudden rush of red flame, and in seconds, the Kalkara was engulfed, burning from head to toe, rushing blindly in circles in a vain attempt to escape. The screams were non-stop, piercing, reaching higher and higher into a scale of agony that the mind could barely comprehend as the rush of flames grew fiercer with each second. And then the screaming stopped and the creature was dead. 